Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. I apologize for the delay. We have some technical issues, but we're now ready to rock and roll. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the uh, last meeting, June 28th. So moved. Second. Second. Um, any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so uh, we have the honor tonight to have with us the chairman of the uh, farm and the Agricultural Farm Land Advisory Board Chair. Um, we invited her to talk to us due to the fact that uh, the town board has referred some issues that uh, they're dealing with uh, for us to uh, listen to. So therefore, at this point, um, Sheila has a presentation she will be sharing with us. So Sheila, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, this is a very simple presentation. Um, feel free to jump in with questions along the way or at the end. Um, so in 2017, um, there were issues around agriculture and farming on Grand Island, and the supervisor appointed a committee of um, farmers, uh, members of the community, some folks from the town, to get together and start talking about what could be done. And so part of what came out of that was um, the desire to um, make sure that we were able to um, continue Grand Island's rich agricultural history, make sure that that was protected and also promoted. Um, and we determined that there was going to be a need to revisit some of the existing regulations and try to make Grand Island more farm friendly. Um, promote agricultural activity, uh, protect the environment, and make it what was happening at the time was making it um, unnecessary to try to hide the fact that you were farming, that you had chickens or whatever it was. Um, one of the things that the group also does is we provide input into neighbor disputes if there's an agricultural cause or we also um, are able to step in and assist the town board in understanding issues from an agricultural perspective. So what's, what came out of that was um, the beginning of a farmland protection plan. And the first step was applying for a grant, um, which we were given. Um, Jim worked with us tirelessly on this. Um, and that's kind of phase one of the farmland protection plan. There's two phases to it. The first is developing the plan, making sure that you've got buy-in from all of the appropriate community members, from the appropriate town boards, from the appropriate county and state uh, groups that are involved, getting the public's feedback, et cetera. Um, so we started that process. The grant was approved. Um, we hired WWS as our planner and started the hard work of putting together the farmland protection plan. Um, the plan is available on the town's website under the Agriculture Advisory Board. Um, so if anybody wants to see, there's a lot of information in there um, that I could not distill down into um, this short presentation. So anybody's interested in kind of seeing what uh, materials were put together for that, who we worked with, um, there's multiple matrixes, et cetera. So that's right up there under the Agriculture Advisory Board on the town website. So our grant was approved, we started the work, we held several public meetings to gather input from residents on various aspects of um, how this would impact the community. We worked with um, Erie County Farmland Planning. We had somebody that sat on our committee um, and was available kind of via email for questions, et cetera. Um, we worked with New York State Ags and Markets. We were assigned a um, director from um, Ag and Markets um, and he assisted us to kind of led us and guided us to ensure that the plan that we put together was something that was going to be approvable by New York State Ag and Markets because ultimately they are the ones that have to review and approve it. Um, we worked with Erie County Soil and Water. You know, part of farming is identifying prime soil and uh, where that is. Um, there were multiple maps put together from the both the comprehensive view of where does it make sense for farming to be on Grand Island, as well as where are the good soils, where are 
um, where are the sewer districts, et cetera. Um, and that kind of guided us in uh, to determine, you know, how we kind of did the overlay for agriculture for Grand Island. So around the end of 2019, the plan was finalized and published to the town board. So the, um, sorry, this thing is in my way, goodness. Um, the board um, adopted the plan in 2019, which included a secret determination and um, a public hearing. The plan was named um, specifically a little bit differently than what typical other town um, farmland protection plans are named. It's usually, you know, the town name, farmland protection plan. Um, but when we were working with Jeff Kehoe from New York State Ag and Markets, he really felt that because Grand Island was a different kind of community, it's not your typical uh, small farming or large farming or a rural community, right? We have a little bit of a, a different feel to us. And he felt that if written properly, um, our plan could become kind of a model for other small towns that really don't fit into the niche of 100% rural. Um, so he asked us to um, give it a little bit of a, a different name than um, what they're typically given uh, because he wanted it to contain all of the information that other towns and communities would be able to utilize in their protection plans as well. And so it is called the Resource Guide for the Protection and Promotion of Farmland and Agriculture. Not a short title. Um, so then that resource guide was reviewed by the Erie County Agriculture and Farmland Protection Board. They are um, required to put some input into it. Um, they provided some comments, we, which we issued and addressed in the, um, in the resource guide. Um, and they formally approved the guide uh, in January of 2020. Um, the state then has to do you know, their review and approval. They did the same. It's then signed off on by Commissioner Ball um, from New York State Ag and Markets. That was done. And then the final resource guide was um, adopted as amended by the Grand Island Town Board in July of 2020. So it was a pretty long process to get there, but it's a pretty long document. Um, so that's kind of phase one, putting together the plan, getting the community input, getting the state and county and town government's input. And then the next phase is implementation. Um, and that's the phase that we're at now. So um, the planning for the implementation is actually part of the resource guide. It's included in matrixes. There's about 10 pages of matrixes um, that document all of the various steps that need to happen in order to implement the full guide. Um, so first things first, the very first thing we needed to correct was the Grand Island's right to farm law. That needed to align with New York State um, it needed to not be overly restrictive to farming that was happening on the island and for future um, possibilities of farming. And that was passed by the town board last year in October. And then one of the ongoing issues, although this wasn't specifically part of our um, implementation plan out of the resource guide, but one of the ongoing issues on Grand Island was the keeping of chickens. Who can keep chickens? How much property do you need to keep chickens? Where do you keep chickens? How many chickens do you get to keep, et cetera? Um, and in our old code, you would need three plus acres to have two chickens, which anybody who has seen the size of a chicken knows that you really probably don't need three acres to keep a chicken. Um, so we reviewed uh, quite a few local uh, laws in our area, you know, mostly in the Western New York area and tried to kind of pick the best of all of those options um, and then uh, provided that to the town board. It went through their process. We went in front of the planning board. Um, it went back to the town board and um, we ended up with what is now referred to as the chicken law um, where on any residential property on Grand Island, you can have six chickens. Um, if you want more chickens, you know, that is dependent upon the size of your property. Um, but that was, uh, I think, a huge win for the residents of Grand Island. They were part of the 
hidden agriculture. Um, you know, people were hiding their chickens um, and now, you know, no need to do so. Okay, so where are we now? Right now we are working through our current code and identifying those places per the implementation matrix um, from the resource guide that we need to address. Um, one of those areas, um, right to farm was the very first one. Um, one of the areas that we needed to address was roadside farm stands. Who can have them? Where are they? How big can they be? Where do they have to sit, et cetera? And then we had to go through the farm or through the town code and identify all of those various places where it would needed to be inserted, et cetera. That's the process. That's the spot that we're at right now. We'll be in front of the planning board in September um, to review the changes um, that were requested um, for this and all of the various areas that changes need to be made, amendments need to be made to current code. So what's next? First of all, a lot, <laughs> um, but we are, some of the things that are in the implementation matrix, which are bubbling up and we're working on now and um, actually have been for a while because the code kind of keeps intersecting. And so we tackle a problem and then we kind of go back to the root problem. So the residential R1A um, zoning is what we are looking at now um, just to ensure that you know, that would be the primary farming um, residential district, um, just in terms of, you know, having space, et, et cetera, on the property. So that's one of them. Um, we are looking at, at uh, one of the things in the matrix was eliminate zoning restrictions on farm buildings as principal structures, um, update zoning definitions, revise incentive and cluster zoning regulations to recognize farming as a means for open space preservation, update zoning definitions to reflect current trends and uses for small scale agriculture, and much more. <laughs> There's a lot more, um, 10 pages worth um, at the end of the resource guide um, of things that we need to work at. So that's that's about it. Any questions? Are you using and are you making use of the um, the open space inventory that um, the Conservation Advisory Board had created had created for them um, a few years ago? I know that that had all the soil and the um, climate information. They've got maps and everything on it. Right. Yeah, yeah, I am pretty sure that that is in our resource guide. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that that was included in our resource guide. And, and all the information that they obtained in the process of getting their open space inventory related to those priority properties. There's 187 of them, so I'm just, you know. Judy, I think what we used was, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but we used like the county or the state statistics. We didn't use the scale that they use for their open space. I mean, I don't know where they got their statistics but, from. Yeah, yet. we, didn't, we so. didn't use that. They hadn't finished that yet. So when we oh, did okay. the guide, we used whatever the county, what was there in the county or the whatever, but it wasn't. Well, it would make sense to use yeah, the counties. They weren't done yet. Yeah, in the DC. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So in the comp, in the comp plan, there is an item in the comp plan. Uh, that comes in under natural resources, um, which is on the first page of the matrix, uh, where it says, where farming is encouraged, ensure zoning regulations that allow for flexibility in agricultural operations in conjunction with New York State Department of Ag and Market Guidelines. The intent is to create an environment in which the community and agriculture can coexist. Uh, then we have a whole section uh, on page 14, 16, and page 37, uh, where we address it uh, in the comp plan. Are you aware of that? Yes, I know that we are. Yes, I know that we are referenced in the comp plan. Okay, so that's why we're having this conversation, uh, because you're doing your work as a board to fulfill that. And I believe that the intent was to make egg, kind of ground on egg friendly. 
that was the kind of the key word, right? Absolutely. Looking at, yep. Looking at the code that actually makes Grand Island uh, ag friendly. So therefore, the consultant that you're working with is reviewing the documents that uh, she feels are counter counter um, productive to farming within the community. Correct. Yep. Which documents are those? Uh -huh. What documents are those? Uh, the town code itself, looking at, at the actual code. At the code, exactly. Okay. Right. So the review is the intent of the resource document has been created by the Action Market Board. Uh, they have a matrix in their document, which she's referred to, um, but that is also stemming right out of the master plan that was adopted in 2018. Um, and right now, I, I guess what I'm leading to is that the you have in front of us a document basically you're going to talk about, which is the farm stand. The farm stand came to you due to the fact that it's part of the uh, of the items that basically isn't ag friendly or has no definition. There is no definition in our current code. There is no code discussing farm stand with the exception of the one section within the 295 sign code. Farm stand. So there's no definition at all for it. A farm stand. Yeah, yeah, like so there has to be. Yeah, there also has to be a certain amount of products that are that are that are collected on the actual farm. I think that was up to I think it was fifty percent you could put within the farm stand. But the question of that was that we had accessory uses, and an accessory use on a certain level is a different than a farm stand would be. So that's why we were trying to actually put a farm stand definition down somewhat concrete that have it stand somewhat on its own yeah from right. accessory use. having a secondary use but almost like a i wouldn't call it retail but you know selling it's some, it's some level of commercial right yeah. right so it is a commercial it's but not it's, a permanent structure right, right. Or anything so like we that. so it's they they defined it and refined it a little bit in the last board meeting i don't see it in the board and they might have done the workshop but so they they uh, they did address it and then they're going to send it to the planning board because they it has to be 20 feet off the road, uh, mm -hmm. the shoulder of the road. And like, like yeah, there was a Jen question. Said, we had gone through that quite a bit in the right. meeting as to where we wanted to do that 20 feet from. We wanted to make it an easy definable line. So, what we were trying to, so we decided that we wanted to basically be at the edge of the road. So, we're trying to come up with the right language as to basically put the grassy pavement because mm -hmm. there's different right of ways and where and everything. So, we really looked at that for quite a, a while, right, Sheila? And yes, we did. Funny enough, that's the one thing that the town board was like, where's the 20 feet? So we tried to define it, but that was one of the things. So yeah, they back they just that. said from from the, I don't know if they said the edge of the pavement or the shoulder of the road. Yeah. One, they said one or the other. I think, yeah. I mean, and I probably mean that's, that's quite a bit of difference. Okay. But, yeah. So I, I guess I'm just going to, um, I mean, uh, you're meeting, you're basically functioning. You do have and created like the economic development has created a place. <clears throat> Uh, marketing study for the town of Grand Island, and there's almost a master plan or a roadmap to what it, things it needs to accomplish. You've done the same thing by actually creating um, a, a resource guide that basically turns around and gives you your roadmap as to the things you need to accomplish. Um, That's correct. Right. And so the one question that was put to me was how then did, did the uh, road stand or yeah, the road stand issue get in front of you? Was it done because it's an issue that came up or was it something that was shown up in a code that wasn't addressed it was because there was nothing in the code that addressed it and it's part of you know if you have a farm you need a way to sell your product and that is the natural way to be able to sell your product right to be able to set up a roadside stand and we wanted to be sure that there were guardrails around it so that it didn't turn into, you know, somebody built a permanent structure that was the size of a log cabin at the curb at the end of their driveway. So we were trying to identify, you know, guardrails that made sense, but address a piece of the code that is truly the majority of the way that most small farms are able to sell their product. It's just going to create a problem for people that just kind of grow some extra zucchinis in their yard and just put them out at the, at the edge of the road and say, you know, honor system, what a zucchini, you know, something like that. Are, are, is this going to be something that code is going to enforce so that we have to start worrying about things? I'm just, 
I'm not, I know I'm nitpicking. No, no, no. I think it's more of duty. Like I understand what you're saying, but this is going to be for, for argument's sake, right? Right. So if there's a, a neighbor dispute, there's something that's there to say, well, this is what our, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot, I know there's a lot of properties that, that have a lot of little farm stands on the bigger road mm -hmm. that are the semi next to the road. Which right. We could go yeah. and point all that, but I like, yes, it's going to be in our code and it's going to be part of our, do I see the, the, the code of block closure going out and tagging everybody? No, but I think it's going to help for the, the sake of, you know, someone's trying to back out of their driveway they can't see because somebody's got something that's sitting there. Yeah, I, just, I, just kind of yeah. Yeah, I just I just wanted to clarify that portion of it that I didn't want, you know, people that were just like on a whim right. side they're going to sell some. Are, are, you, are you implying that you're going to have to uh, require a permit for the stand? No, no, it'll be a permitted use. It will. It, we will not need a permit for it. It will be an allowed use. So it's a temporary stand. It's temporary. Temporary, right? and it very specifically says temporary. Yes. In size and height, and mm -hmm. where it can be. And because there's a lot of there's a lot of stands out right now. Yeah. Correct. So if you're going to define a, a a stand, um, you know, and, it, and I'm I'm assuming that it's because. You, it might be a larger stand that might have many items for sale, you know, for the farmer's goods. So, you know, it would almost seem like you you would need some type of a, a permission to do that. Well, I wonder too with the. I mean, rather rather than just having a couple of uh, of uh, uh, stands out for eggs and vegetables or honey, like I see down on White Haven Road, uh, I, it sounds like you're talking about a little. Uh, you know something bigger and not necessarily not, not, not for a roadside stand not no. for roadside yeah so it doesn't require the, the entity selling to be an incorporated business have a tax id number so yeah. just some neighbor no. stand up and sell yeah or you've got six chickens in your backyard and you know you so you now have four dozen eggs a week and you don't need four dozen eggs a week you know why not let your neighbors buy those and uh big basket of tomatoes that you grew that you can't right. eat right right I, I roll out a trailer and offer people free free apples <laughs> there you go it's what? it's temporary it's portable as long as you don't block the right of way and block people's view to their road right it's kind of hard to define though so um i was trying to share it but this is only looking at like so many documents and i've got a million documents open let me see if i can find this so I can actually um, share the definition with you. Yeah. Yeah. So where we're going with this is the fact is that um, I don't think this committee is going to be in a position to turn around and basically rule up or down on anything that's coming from the board. Sure. But we want to know and make sure this board is conscious of what other boards are doing. Right. Mm -hmm. we'll talk to the conservation by recreation and so mm -hmm. on and talk about what is your objectives, where you're going, what have you accomplished? And I think that's where we are with the exit market at this moment. Um, they're, they're definitely going to be for the planning board uh, to get into the discussion of the, of the stands. Uh, and then they're going to have to, like she's done tonight, uh, frame it as to what the intent was and also what, what kind of criteria uh, is going to be involved in it. And basically one of the things is that if you don't have any definition of something and everybody out is out there just basically doing whatever they want now we got a problem and what's happening is more and more stands are showing up and the question is no guidelines as to what is proper and what is improper and then how do you take one to court or how do you deal with one as a problem when you really have to find out how you're going to be fair about implementing a plan or implementing a judgment on a stand. Um, and, I, and the issue is the stand, as far as what I understand, is broad in its definition, meaning that if I am I have a bunch of chickens and I'm going to basically want to sell my eggs, and that's happening on Staley Road. I mean, there's a woman that has a, a box outside on, on the street at the end of her driveway, and basically it says, you know, eggs available, da da da. And you, 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 it's an honor system where you just go up and put the money in the box and walk off with the eggs. Right. So, well, I think the back thing of this, so 
The town of Grand Island, we approved that our Cubbit town would be a right to farm town. So we've defined ourselves as a right to farm town. So now we have this board where there's a Jim and I that are not farmers that sit on that and try to look at it from that perspective. So we approved that, and then we did the resource guide, which the town approved, but they were happy with that resource guide and the guidance that we had for the town board had approved that. So now those are both approved. What we're doing is going through that resource guide, looking at the codes and make sure they match up, like everything that you guys have been doing on this board for a year, the crossover where it makes sense on 407.2 and it doesn't make sense on 420. Like there's different language and different words. So it's trying to coordinate that. So this makes sense, like this thing with the other one. So that's where it's taken us a while to get there, but that's why we're at farm stands and signs right now when you're starting there. Was that slide, Sheila? I just wrote a note for myself. You said the potential to revise uh, R1A or create a new A agricultural code. Is that specific to farm stand or is that a wider brush that that was? No, that's a much wider brush. The farm stand, one small piece, right? And, and really, we chose this one to start with just because it's a little more contained, you know, there's only four or five spots um, that we would have to amend code. It's pretty small amendments. And we thought this was a good kind of get started with this um, because our 1A is gonna be a lot bigger, obviously, right? There's, that's, that's broad ranging in yeah. terms of code amendments, et cetera. Does the creation of even more zoning code fly in the face of Potential moves of form based code at some point. So that, that's what concerns me when I start hearing creation of new code. It's already a, a, a mess. Not saying anything whether it's needed, we may need right, it. Right, right. But I think those are just things for us to back burner and also make sure because yeah. the master plan is is highly written around the detangulation of less that though even a word of, uh, of the mess of a code we have now. So mm -hmm. adding more ingredients to that soup, I think. I don't know that we're adding more. I think what we're doing is refining some of what is there, right? We're not we're not going to throw another 300 lines of code at things. What we're trying to do is find it because I'll tell you currently our code when it comes to agriculture, farming, agricultural animals is not in good shape. There is, you know, things contradict each other. Um, one thing says you need three acres, another piece, another part of code says you need five. Something says you can have 10 animals. Well, 10 animals, what? 10 horses, 10 chickens, 10 what, right? Agricultural animals is a, a huge wide variety of things. So I don't know that we're, I think we're refining and making sense in terms of agriculture. That makes sense. I think any revision seems to yeah, assuming we're trying towards moving yeah, it's the form. Giving, it's, it's defining the actual definitions and yes, putting those bumpers. It's not saying, okay, now you're allowed to have just here what you weren't allowed to have before. It's putting it there to say, well, you know, defining what exactly that is. So when a quarter code enforcer comes up or a neighbor problem has, or there's animals that are be putting in there or whatever it is, there's an actual guideline and definition to fall back on. It's not really saying, okay, now you can keep pigs in the Sandy Beach area. It's not saying that at all. It's just defining it clearer for guidance. Her eyes can Sorry, and I just want to say, we will never say that it's okay to have pigs in a Sandy Beach backyard. <laughs> just, I want to put that out there. If they're cooked, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Barbecued, I'm all over. So another reason, so now, like what she was saying is so all of, now that we go through these and a lot of stuff's going to be changing coming to town board and referring to us that we might, we're going to see a lot of this because we're, there's a lot to dig into right Jim? right so there's going to be a lot of conversation around this of trying to fix all this well i think that the, the thing that you should understand is that and and i'm going to get right to the, the thing is why do we have an ag, ag board uh on grand island I mean, everybody comes as like we open the door by having our own egg board. The egg board on Grand Island is our protection because it's home rule. Uh, before the board was established and then started to govern what was going on egg use within the community, we were managed by both the county of Erie and the state of New York. And so if there was a dispute, it would actually end up in front of the egg and market of Erie County. And then Erie County would turn around and decide, well, we think it should be. And not take into consideration what the community itself wants or what it was, it was developing at. 
So by having our own ag, ags and market board on Grand Island, we have a seat at the table that basically tells the county, this is what we would expect on our town. This is how we want to see ag being handled in our town. Therefore, it isn't an outside source that's basically uh, trumping anything that happens within our community. And so, but in doing so, we really need to at least come up with guidelines on how to behave and how do we coexist. And that was what was in the comp plan is saying, how do you co we want agriculture to coexist with residential? Because we've already stated that we're going to be an ag town. That was done in 2011. So the problem with the law that was adopted in 2011 was it has said that we're right to farm law, but you can only grow things. You can't raise things in 2011. That's the law. Right. But in New York state law is all about growing and raising, right? So the issue is that the first thing needed to be established was do we fit within the state law itself under the right to, right to farm law? And that's what the first thing was done by this board uh, was to turn around and actually tackle that and get the code changed so that it was written it's, which is in concert now with the state of New York. So I think that we're, we have some issues that are going to be coming up for this board that are going to be interesting uh, going forward. And then obviously everything is going to go before the planning board because the planning board uh, looks and reviews anything that's going to change the code. So that's the process that's in front of us. Um, but I thought it was important for us tonight uh, to actually talk to Sheila and introduce to us, Sheila is now part of this board uh, and is a member of the board. And uh, we'd like to continue to find out what is being moving forward with each of the boards and seeing what they're doing and what issues are going to be impacted. And also, from our point of view, how does it impact some of the things we're doing? And obviously, the firm based coding is one of the things right off the bat. How's it affecting the bigger picture? Uh, and where do we go and how can we then start looking at moving that piece along? Because I think it's really important that we start to look at some of these folks. Yes, yeah, John, huh? I mean, Dave. Dave. Gloria. 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 Uh, Sheila, a couple of quick questions real quick. Sure. You, you said the street line. What, what, what are you defining as the street line? So here, here's the problem that we ran into on the board, and we're going to have to have this discussion because right of way is not defined in our code. Currently, there is no definition for right of way in our code, at least none that we were able to find. So we tried to figure out what, if, if there is no right of way, and it's certainly not up to the Ag Board to make that definition in our code, right? What, what do we use as the 20 foot? Like what we're trying to do is not have somebody put their farm stand on the curb or in front of their mailbox so their neighbor can't get out or the mailman can't get there, right? And so we had talked about is 20 feet from the center of the road, because my understanding is based on whether it's a county road, a state road, or a town road, that could be, you know, what the right of way is could be different. Maybe that's why it's not in our code. I don't know. Okay, so like we don't know what that is. I mean, honestly, we don't know. Just to interrupt, yep. East River is a 99 foot road and the road is 40 feet, but it's not in the middle of the 99 feet in a lot of instances. So right. if you say 20 feet from the center of road, I'm gonna still be in real, real close to the road. That's one, one point. And then you say parking, adequate parking. So shouldn't it be something that's more geared towards that person, that farmer's, driveway that you could pull in their driveway to get to a stand so in, in a lot of off cases, of east river where there's no shoulder uh there's in a, a lot ditch. of cases that's what it will be it will have to be the driveway right, right? and then when you say a non-permanent structure so if i sink a four by four in the ground and put a little box on the top with my uh what it uh zucchinis in there is that a permanent structure if it doesn't move, it's permanent. Okay. Like, yeah. Okay. Those were just my questions. Okay. Thank you. Yep. yep. Dave, I yeah, think if, if someone could define for us what what the actual right of way is as a like a general rule, that would be awesome. But we can't find we can't find that. Or we'll refer it back to us 
define that. Oh, they did refer it back to you in the yeah. meeting because they kept saying like maybe they mean from the shoulder or do they mean from the edge of the pavement yeah so, so they, they were town board was confused about it too yeah so i, I think i think it should be from their front property line back because the right-of-ways are all over the board all over grand island sometimes yeah. you have uh, uh i'm a builder so sometimes the lots are five feet off of the the road and sometimes they're 50 feet away. So maybe what I need to do is take a look at some of the existing, because what I don't want to do is, you know, make it impossible for people who are currently using roadside stands, having no issues, no neighbor complaints, been operating for many years, right? Go and see where they are from the beginning of their property line. And right. then we might have to change that 20 feet. Right. I know I've stopped at some of them and I'm on the right of way and then I have to go over the you know the grassy ditch to get to the little stand to buy whatever they're selling right and I always thought that was uh dangerous yeah I know a few places have put like little pull-ins by the right. end of you know which is great or you just use their driveway right, right. nobody okay. wants anybody to be getting killed in traffic to get a tomato okay so thank you I think the idea was that we were trying to say we were trying to make it simple enough that you didn't have to pull out a property line map, but enough that you know a resident could figure it out somewhat easy enough. And yet, I mean, something would obviously stand out that you know that wasn't right. Like that's that's the language we were trying to figure out is uh, how we could do that and not make it overly you know complicated to find that. Yep. Yep. Aren't there aren't there some traffic and safety rules around how how close to to a road you can you can uh, plant a tree or plant some hedge that might be obstructing your neighbor's uh, view? Nothing in the right of way. You're not supposed to have anything in the right of way that's not your property. So you're not supposed to plant. And, we, or and put if a we rock. haven't, but if we haven't defined the right of way, well, the the right of way is generally the the width of the road and then when you take the road out of that number that leaves you the right of way so like my home on east river i have a 99 foot east river road but the 40 foot road is slammed all the way over towards the riverside so i have a big 40 well, 50 how, how do you know right how do you know how do you know where the road ends then because of your property line the road butts the front of your property line. Oh, okay. All right. So the individual that's got to so put a lot, a lot of instances you're mowing, where, yeah. you're mowing grass that's I got in it. the right of way. It's not yours. It's in the right of way. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're starting to see what the uh, ag board is dealing with. Um, and anytime you start to deal with something that is already kind of there and nobody's been managing it and all of a sudden you're now going to be talking about managing one of the questions come up is that if you have somebody doing a lemonade stand um does this apply um the answer basically came back is are you growing lemons so if you're not then you put that apply <laughs> so <laughs> so um well from a commerce standpoint why i asked about the ein and the like from the chamber standpoint like the original small business is farming so like we love nothing more than our farmers, right? But at the same point, we don't want that to get watered down or by a lack of differentiation of somebody who just wants to sell something at their street, which we don't care about either. But how do we support that, those organizations as legitimate in the farming community versus not stepping on this right to farm idea for everybody? So those are, we just talked about this in the chamber probably two meetings ago, just trying to find areas we can support. So I'd like to plug in another point because this kind of all flows into that. Who's who, who do they do and why do they do it? And what are they allowed to do? We're, we're kind of we're comparing and talking about like, well, what's a garage sale, right? Mm -hmm. So if you had a garage sale on your property every week and it was always there, then that you kind of turn that more into a business. And you would be right. expected to pay sales like, tax on it. You know, you your kids selling someone selling lemonade, or yeah. you have it, you have an overabundance of I don't know zucchini, and you put a little table out there and say, mm -hmm. you know, free zucchinis or like that's something temper like that's really not I don't I. So we were kind of trying to 
to talk about well, what makes a garage sale a garage sale and not in that same way where people are pulling over the side of the road, they're selling things kind of thing. So that's when we went into the definitions of, of how much of the product you'd have to actually raise or whatnot on your own. And it wouldn't be permanent, but it would be something that would be there <laughs> like, the whole summer or the whole fall. But doesn't the state in, in some cases have some jurisdiction over the, the amount. I mean, they do over somebody that has a garage sale every single week. There's state laws that say, if you're doing that, you're basically running a business. And you've got cases. Yeah. yeah. There's gonna be 67,000. Well, you know, the sales around. tax people will come in and say, you've got to be charging sales right. tax. So that's right. one of the things. So I'm looking at the farmers. We want them to be able to, to sell their product. And, and I, we don't have big commercial farmers on the island per se. We have more, I mean, we do have some that are making a living at that. But I think some of them, they do sell at roadside stands, but perhaps mm -hmm. they sell other places too. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure, you know, how it works. Well, but Thompson, Lake Thompson Farm, that's a commercial enterprise. It's a whole different mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, right. right. And then, then it's, it's the one that does the beef down in, um, uh, there's some other ones that right, but like Susie's is something that we talked about. Well, that's, that's something that was been grand grandfathered in because we were trying to look at that as an example of situations. And so we really tried to look all it. Yeah, I get where you're going. Only exceptions is only the time we're making a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Sandy, and I guess, Eric, for you to know, like part of what's in the implementation matrix is exactly that. So right now we're kind of you know, we're taking steps, right? This is a this is a big process. There's a lot that falls under agriculture. You know, there's agritourism. There's there's a lot of stuff out there. And so, but the first steps has to be allowing a farm to exist on Grand Island and not have to fight to the death in order to be able to, you know, continue to grow, continue to expand and sell. So that's really what we're focusing on initially. But if you look at the implementation guide uh, or matrix, there's a lot in there specifically to do with marketing and how do you get your products out? And can we get a, C a Grand Island CSA going? You know, can we get local, a, a permanent farmer's market going? All of that is included in the resource guide. But we have to get there, it's baby steps. Do you have that uh, book on tape yet or no, is that to be read? Let me know when it's uh, on CD. What's book. that? Let me know when I can stream that thing on tape, book on tape, but I'm all, I'm all over it. <laughs> you don't want to read 144 pages? I'm, I'm an average reader, but this, I'm a lot in the car. I'd love to hear a book on tape versus, yeah, thank you. You know, it's something that, like a lot of people, which I question in my software, you know, when we're looking at egg animals and what fits where and whatnot, but on the other level, you know, we talk about this somewhat being unrestricted. If anything, I think this gives a better guide and a better protection to your neighbor. Like now, I mean, it's all open and we're talking about it right now, but I think in the whole, it's going to give a more protection in, in these zones, in these areas, in these neighborhoods. When there's actually something there, then, you know, there's, there's nothing there now. There's nothing there except for, yeah. you know, it's so in the long run, wrong. it's going to be better. Except for the kind of what supported them, you kept becoming part of an agricultural district. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't know how many, I mean, probably Tom is, and there's a, yeah. a lot of, the, and some of the smaller places on the island that are part of the, the Angus, and some people that apply that going one on. That was a, that was specifically though, a, a, a knee jerk reaction to the fact that it was hard to farm on this island unless you had 20 acres. So, you know, there was a huge influx of ag district properties in 2016, 2017, 2018, because there wasn't that that's what that was the impetus to this entire process was, you know, New York State Ag and Markets and Erie County Farmland Protection was getting overwhelmed with applications. They would typically get one application, two applications a year from Grand Island. They were getting 50, 60 because there was no home rule. And so we just kept pushing to the state and to the county. So okay. that's why they were like, yeah, get the grant, figure out home rule, get it off of us. That's when it turned out to be a problem between the town and the residents and the, and the farmer because there was nothing set there. So 
the downstairs here was telling them one thing when it was another thing, and then the other one got approved for this. This didn't get approved for that. So that's what kicked all this to like, right. all right, we need to have all and then, and then what kicked in was the use permits. <coughs> so the expect use permits kicked in. The question is, you do a special permit for a chicken, and if you use it, the rule being one animal per acre, well, you have a horse per acre, but one chicken per acre. So that became a real issue because how do you interpret that? Yeah. And so again, down to uh, you have to look at eggs market, or you. And so a lot of people, because they didn't want to, uh, they weren't being dealt with by the code, meaning code enforcement officer. They basically turned around and said, "I guess we're just going to trump it, and we, we're going to go right to eggs market." And that's why there was a huge expansion of the county coming in and saying, you're approved, you're approved. And people that had less than an acre turn around got approved in an egg and market. And you're sitting there going, how does less than an acre get into the eggs and market when the eggs market were traditionally looking at acreages, you know, you know, 10 or 15 acres, not looking at a quarter of an acre. So I think it, it came down to the point where we need to have its own home rule. And that's where we are, we are. Um, I like it. Good fences make good neighbors for a reason. I think good rules create clarity. I wouldn't want to move into what I think is a residential neighborhood and, and have somebody raising a lot of livestock that wasn't obvious. Right. Yeah. At the same way, if I have the right to raise them, I don't want someone moving in and building a house saying, you no longer because my house is here. Yeah. So I think this makes for for better neighboring it does. in government than not well, having the rules. The other right. thing we were talking about is like, what, so right now is we're trying to Put something together more for real estate agents because they really are supposed to be handing this out at the time of sale and, and, and what the definite yeah. mapping a, a section saying we are a right to farm. So if you're looking at these property here, you know this is a right to farm. This is where your property falls in. That is supposed to be happening at the transfer, but it's right. not. That's, thing is, too. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's not happening. So we've been no. working at that too. Right? And the agricultural uh, district, even yeah. from that, I mean, you're really, if, if somebody's yeah. in an agricultural district, you really should know that if you're buying a prop, piece of property, something that's already in an ag, in the ag district on Grand Island. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually the law. You are right. supposed to notify them that yeah. you are purchasing a property next to an agricultural district property. And with that means blah, blah. There's, there's a form. I'm, I'm actually working on that right now. I'm going to put together a packet. Um, I just need to figure out how we get this dispersed. Eric, I was going to reach out to you. I'm going to reach out to the town. Um, but we need to make sure that real estate agents and brokers, et cetera, have this and are, are giving it to everybody that's looking at buying property so that they're very clear um, oh, well, what they're getting. I'm sorry, Sheila. Do you think that's a welcome packet item for everybody who buys a house no matter what? Because we're trying to still redevelop that something we can give to the realtors so so that a realtors is no extra as informed realtor. Absolutely, because there should be you know the right to farm law should be in there, the chicken law should be in there. You know, by law, somebody should be being notified if they are buying a property next to an ag district. But in the ag district notification, we can say, you know, just go to this web link, type in your address, and it'll tell you all around you where the ag district properties are. So I think that'd be great in a welcome packet for sure. We're looking at QR pages that had, you know, a page of maps, uh, a page of important, and people like scanning that on it. So anyway, that's definitely, you could be, I'm fine. You can definitely buy me lunch anytime we'll talk. Okay, uh, I'll buy you lunch. I'll take up your up on your offer I just made for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, in wrapping up, um, any more questions for Sheila? No, thanks for all the hard work you and the committee. Yeah, and great work. Know, right? Sheila but, does yeah. a lot of work. I know. <laughs> thanks. All right, Sheila. Now I expect you to stay online and be here for the meeting. Right? I'm on. I'm here. I'm part of this board too. I'm here. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to uh, the PDD recommendation. So we've been uh, in the last meeting. We did a lot of work, and Rhonda did some fantastic uh, work of compiling it into a, a, a um, I want to say cohesive and more of a, um, a style that you understand what we said, right? I mean, she's basically sat down and her and I have turned around and actually beat this thing to death. We made sure that all the points we brought up at the last meeting were all part of it. Um, I did send this out for review to my uh, two tech advisors, which is Judy Smith and uh, Paul Lechner and let them beat it up and, and throw some more 
uh, pieces at it. Um, in, in a conversation, uh, it became almost evident that we're looking at a, a um, mixed use application. And in doing so, we're looking at uh, something that is looking at commercial with a residential component. Uh, one of the things that came up was the question of residential with a commercial <clears throat> component, but not be attached to a residential development, meaning that the mixed use be contained within a, a building or within a, a within a structure that is not a build a, a store and then have a big housing development behind it, meaning that's a mixed use. But the intent of this law was to say a maximum or minimum of 10 acres and that it be a mixed use objective uh, with the understanding that is not be uh, in conjunction with a residential development, that it be contained to a building or a multi-purpose building. Um, but it also became evident that if this goes in place and you have projects that are 25 acres and better on Grand Island, which we have a number of South Point and town in the river town and so on, that by eliminating that um, minimum of 25 acres still applies to a degree. And so therefore, uh, we looked at then bringing forward to you uh, two, rec a recommendation of two PDD types. One is to continue with the PDD of, of 25 acres and above, and therefore call that a major uh, PDD, and then have a minor PDD, which is minimum 10 acres. Um, we're also looking at, it came out of the conversation, that both of them should have automatic expire if work hasn't been, paperwork hasn't been accomplished in two years, and also uh, had something actually done on the grounds within five, not just turn around and signing a, um, a paying for a water permit or a sewer permit. That is not indicating that something physically has, has happened within the project. Other towns, when I talked to them, uh, started off with PDs like we had PDs and found they went sideways on them due to the fact that they had many, many, many of them developing in our towns, but also found that many, many of them are just stirring and weren't going anywhere. They're not being pushed, they're not being, they're not being developed, they're not, uh, which is creating a problem on the long run. So from the conference of time review, we look at Tommy Grand Island and we review our comp plan every 20 years. And in doing so, the town changes in its 20 years. What we do, what has been developed, uh, and the, the attitude and what was acceptable and what is not acceptable, the master plan then reflects. But if you have PDDs that have been sitting on the books for 20 years and have not been developed, well, it's counterproductive to us actually moving our community forward. Um, the law currently on, on the PDD 25 acres and plus indicates that the town board needs to take action by setting a public hearing to actually take a PDD away from a developer. Well, there's no, there's no, there's no incentive then for the town or the developer to even ask for, or for the town even taking the action to actually take it away. So therefore, we're taking, we're putting the, the objective back into the planning effort and actually indicating that they will automatically expire. So therefore, the onus on the developer is to produce. If you're going to have a plan, then make the plan come to life. You don't get a plan and put it on your property and then set on it for the next 25 years. We've had a number of projects on Grand Island books that have set for 30 years. And in the 30 year period, they do not even reflect what they look like when they were adopted 30 years prior. So therefore, even in the intent of the PDD, they do not become fulfilled as to what they were intending to do from the very beginning. And a number of factors may kick in. One, the, the market for selling. Two, the environmental market, wetlands, the delineation. All those things change what they literally can do with their property from the first time they actually submit and got approved by the planning board. So I strongly suggest that in putting going forward with this plan, that we indicate in both plans that they automatically expire and turn back to, and resort back to the existing zoning uh, at the time that they were presented. 
therefore they're not, they're then uh, null and void. And they do not need town board approval for such action to occur. That's what these two doc this document here is in front of you uh, that we have presented. Um, I'm hoping that you've all taken the time to read it. Um, and if you sure that you think you know, is there anything here that you think is going to be a problem or we've omitted, uh, this is the time we want to discuss it. In That's a lot, right? To that, that automatic termination, Jim, underneath that, the discussion was that if it was an existing PDD prior to this change in the code, that it then would have uh, provisions in it that it could become an automatic termination, but with special things like it needs to have paperwork or some type of permit in place and construction of a structure within three years. Yeah. So it still falls in line with the new one. Yes. The way that other towns have turned around and dealt with their PDDs, they have sat on the books, is they've actually turned around and changed the PDD law so it automatically expires in it. And therefore, they eliminated a ton of PDDs that were on the books within their community. Um, and therefore, as a tool to actually get it to the point where these PDDs are functional uh, and not just existing within the community. And so, what we're asking for and what's in this document is a practice that's been done within. The state of New York, um, and it's been implemented in more than one town within the state of New York. Yeah, so we're giving them what we're giving them if there's existing, we're giving them three years to right. do something, just like we give everybody else. So you know, you've had it for 20 years, you haven't done anything. So moving forward now, you need three years. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the law. It's like what they've been granted that PDA, right? Right. Yes. Right. They already right. Have PDA, it was, so it's yeah. Pre-existing, right, right. Image. So any PDD, which there's only one, two, there's there's two right now that yeah. that I haven't had anything done on them right now. Right, and I'm what, assuming somebody could, if, if there was a designation, a lost designation, they could always reapply. Like, and it would just be a start over process, right? They'd start from square one, right, right, but right, so right. Permanently omitted because they yeah. lost one. Well, actually, one of them's already got something started on. So basically, there's only one PDD on Great right. Island that hasn't been started yet right. at all. So and it's actually giving some protection because as as it's written now, if I understand it correctly, the town board could decide with a public hearing to take the PDD away without giving notice. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, but they're also saying here's a fallback. So let's say somebody come forward and said, well, it's been five years, but the problem is the Corps of Engineers has not given me my permit. And therefore, there are circumstances that is that's beyond their ability to move forward because of a, a <coughs> designation by another agency. At that time, the town board can turn around and say, "We understand that." So, give us a timeline. You can finish. Yeah, that makes. I mean, humans should always right. a lot of conversations should always trump the, the, the written word right. in, a, in a situation. Yeah, of elected so, officials. So this is an, 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 isn't basically saying it's black and white. It's basically saying. The onus is on the developer to come forward with your project, get it approved by the planning board, and then move to the planning board and recommendation to the town board. Town board then make an motion to adopt their okay. PDD. And then it's up to the onus of the owner to actually produce. Yeah, I mean, you could exempt it, you could extend the, the, the period of termination if they came up, like Jim said, with the logical. Thing. But um, so I'm Perfectly in favor with the, the termination clause. We should have had. I, I'm in favor of that too. Yeah, yeah. I, that's just something that needs to be in there. And there's an out for people if, if something comes along. But you come to us, and Dave. You know, you come to the planning board. Come, they come to the planning board. They have all these grandiose ideas. They get a PDD, and then just languishes there for years and years. And and then when somebody comes along and wants to build something next to it, they go, yeah, but we got a PDD and we can build wherever we want to, so you can't do that there. So it's, you know, we want to build this, but we've waited 10 years to do it, but you want to do this now at, next to us, and we're saying we don't want you to do that because we might build something here. That, that happened on Whitehaven. Right, yeah, I know. <laughs> I was trying to be coy. Example. coy yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Can I can I ask a question? Currently, I think the code is or the law is that the town board can remove your PDD after two years. Why are you bumping it up an extra year for existing? Well, the code basically says the town board could eliminate it in two years 
after it's conducted a public hearing. Okay. So, but the town board has elected, has not in, in its history, actually turned around and decided to pull a PDD because it's reluctant to actually call a public hearing because then the onus is on them to prove that the project would not be able to be uh, functional. So actually the building, they have to pull a building permit within two years, Dave. Yeah, but the, the PDD, the town board, the, the public hearing is a two week process. They can say on the first of, yes. of, of the month, uh, we're gonna have a, a public hearing to remove this PDD on the 15th of the month. So, I mean, why are we giving them an extra year, the existings? I I mean, if they haven't done anything, obviously, in years, why should we go from two to three? Why shouldn't we stay with the two? When I talked to the, the, other, the other town, the other town, which is, what, I, what is, <laughs> oh, the other, but the other issue is that in due process and being fair, you're now changing, you're changing the rules. And then doing so, they need to react. And if they hadn't reacted, you're giving them a fair amount of time to react. Okay. Okay, I understand. Okay. Okay. So therefore, it isn't black and white tomorrow. You don't exist because you haven't moved forward already. So oh, yeah. the clock now starts. You have three years. If you don't, you automatically go back to what you were. The other problem will be for them is that this law basically indicates that if you have a PDD as a residential and you lose your PDD and your 10 acres, you lose your residential. Because PDD 10 is going to be commercial and residential. Right. It has to be mixed use. It has to be mixed use. Okay. Otherwise, you know, the, the 20, you can't put mixed use on 25 acres. Is that what you're going to say? Or you can, can have you? mixed use in, in 25 acres, but you can't have mixed use with the residential and explain ex residential without having a commercial component. But are we looking at mixed use for things that are like buildings that are mixed use only in in um in uh, 10 acres or more subdivision um, in minimum 10 acres. If PDD, a yes. minimum of 10 acres, you would have to have a mixed use building there. Yeah. It would have to be a mixed use building. It would have to be a mixed use building. It couldn't be, well, anything else would be as a right to build there. Right. So, or kind of. Yeah, because I mean, if you if you want to build townhouses, then R to go to R two. If right. you want to do a, you want R one A, R one B, use those to build your subdivisions. But in this component, if the mixed, the one thing we're missing within our code is mixed use. So okay, if we just put mixed use in our code. Could they go and have, how would they get the code changed if they just wanted to have their parcel changed to a different code? They would still have to go to the planning board and get it all done. Yep. So it's not a zoning board thing, it's the planning board. Correct. Thing. So anything doesn't, okay. All we're doing is adding another tool for the planning board to turn around and deal with anything 10 acres and then over, yeah, over minimum 10 acres and the other one minimum 25 acres. If the planning board may turn around and say, you know, we're going to dump the 25 entirely and just go with the minimum 10 and, and basically eliminate residential PDDs. So will we restrict where you can't? I mean, there's a lot of 10 acre plots all over the place. Are we going to restrict where we can have these 10 acre PDDs? I mean, you know, maybe on Whitehaven Road next to branches? I mean, I, I just, I mean, I there's a 10 acre plot right, right there. Be for the benefit of, of Grand Island. So that's, yeah. that's where you have to use that scale to figure out is this fit? Is this right? Is this our filthy? We don't really have to get into that. It no, goes right. back to the comp plan and doesn't the comp plan lay it out is, where you right. want right. certain things? It, 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 we're saying that because in it, we turn around and say it needs to fit the comp plan. So if you look at the comp plan, where would this fit? It fits in the hamlets. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. It fits in the hamlets. That's where it traditionally would be applied is in a hamlet area that's been designated on the comp plan. Any other area, you look at our map, you'll find that we have designated those uses by their by their zoning, R1A, B, C, D. So therefore, the land use has been set. The one thing that isn't in place, and especially I'm talking to the River Oaks area, is that we're looking at a hamlet River Oaks. And in doing the, the River Oaks design, and that's why we're even discussing this one, because in the design, we turned around and said that, and we did a charrette. And in the charrette, we turned around and indicate 
what is a hamlet and what a hamlet would look like in River Oaks. And in doing so, we came up with two designs, right? Mm -hmm. This one and this one. The yellow and the, and the orange is mixed use. We don't have mixed use in our code. So this could not come true with the existing code we have in our town. So if we're not going to, if we're not pushing for mixed use zoning, then this becomes the next best thing in making the PUD that is mixed use, therefore allowing the hotel to be a mixed use. Also the building that's up behind the parking lot, plus the buildings that are sitting on Whitehaven and East River. So this the only reason we're addressing the PDD at this time is how do in the comp plan are we able to accomplish the hamlet without having a code in place for it to come into reality? And that's why we're addressing it. So to me, the code we're actually presenting is allowing this design or this design to move forward. And I still believe that the town uh, to look at actually moving forward and actually developing the Hamlet uh, designs for each of the areas designated in the comp plan so that it would be no more cookie cutters going on that you would have a plan like this you would present to the developers saying this is a concept of what we'd like to see the Hamlet be. And this Hamlet design would be in conjunction with the residents and the stakeholders within that end. Right. Yeah. So we could, so we would be looking not mm -hmm. only at mixed use, but density. Yes. And in also, this, and also given the developer concept, we'd love to see this program right. bring Correct. Up and they right. could come through with another idea and saying, well, the buildings, we're going to do this configuration. You gave us a footprint and you're saying what we'd like to see in the footprint. But you're also looking at the fact is when, when River Oaks came to us and said, we want to change the um, the at B1 and make it into R2 and therefore reduce the, the B1 down. The conversation came up with women, but the R2, R1, this B1 is sitting there, is there because we feel it's necessary for the Hamlet to, to exist, meaning it's the business component of the Hamlet, mm -hmm. right? So if you reduce that footprint, then we throw the balance of what could happen within a hamlet. And that's what we're we are actually designing and taking care. And therefore we came back and said, no, we, we're not recommending a reduction of the land of the B1 because it is an, an important component of what we perceive as a hamlet within the River Oaks area. Right. Well, they came back with some mixed use in there. Yeah, they did. So, but there still was only four acres. Yeah. Yeah. I think they said, oh, sorry, they would go all the way up though, Judy. That was a good I, you know, they, they left and I don't know where they're at I'm, now. So yeah. that's, that's the, I, yeah. How do you know Dave knows where it's at now? Yeah. Yeah. They haven't come back again since the last time. So we're talking Frank. Oh, he's coming back next month. Next, next planning board meeting. They just came in for discussion about the reduction. And we all said we wanted to agree with the long range about going down uh, Whitehaven and not just doing the sideways slice. Yeah, they and, still they, and they were okay with that. And my other question is, is should 10 acre PDDs only be allowed in, in the Hamlet areas and not everywhere? We're not we're not saying that it'd be, but most likely it would be in the Hamlet areas. Because otherwise, know. what would be the difference from the 10 and the 25? Correct. That was all over the place. I Why would you need both? Why would you need both then? Yeah. Well, okay. The Hamlet set, it could have three PDDs in there depending on the size of the Hamlet, but the Hamlet still it's an overlay of the Hamlet, which is the comp plan as opposed to having the the PDD becoming the base. Correct. We don't have a Hamlet code. We have a kind Hamlet of a concept, right. but the instrument to do the Hamlet is the most PDD. likely would be the PDD. Right. Because or of the multiple PDDs, depending on or the multiple of PDDs. The yeah. yeah. And then remember, you need power, water, sewer, you know, cement. It's a right. whole big scale right. to it. And, and it's one parcel. We can't split zone parcels. Dave, when, when I get to the planning board level, I'm sure that the asset test is going to be applied 
I think that what we're presenting is a recommendation <clears throat> and basically given a direction that we think it should go in. But mm -hmm. I think the planning board gets their hands on it, they're going to look at it from another perspective, which I'm looking forward to that, that conversation. Okay. So, there's how many PDVs now? I'm looking at the zoning map, it looks to be three. There's that code that exists. That exists. South Point is PDV. Yeah, South Point, South Point um, Creek. Stony and Whitehaven area looks like a church that would be yep. Gun Creek. Gun yep. Creek. One east of there. That's a, that's a, called um Whitehaven Farms, I believe. That's dead. the one next to the where the solar farm is going. Yeah, and that's the one that's been dead that's been saying that's that. actually in an agricultural district. Yes. That is an agriculture part of an agricultural district. So not and, only and a PDD too. Not only is it a PD that's been designed and approved being a residential um, PD, but it's uh, actually getting an exemption for being a farm. Where the oh. solar farm is going in. Oh. Mm. So really the only PD that has the that 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 yes. the south one here. The it's other one that we've been talking about with that and these projects is the South That's M1. That's M1. District. It has an agricultural exemption. I think that bad. No, it has an agricultural $123,000 agricultural exemption on school and property tax. Is it? And when they were granted a PDD, it's just like, no. No. Well, I I mean, on one level, too, I was thinking this may be a different way of looking about it, but if we grant PDDs at a lower acreage, I think it would allow for maybe a smarter development plan on something. So when you have something that, I don't know, let's say like a South Point or whatnot, we will have to come in with this major development or plan that's going to take 30 years. They can use it piece by piece and build it in more, I think, constructive, maybe responsible ways. I don't know. Well, but, I think just, just to understand that the PED, if we allow, if you did 10 acres, Whatever you designate in the 10 acres is what you can do in that 10 acres. You right. can't do anything more or more or less. Right. In other words, you can't have a parking lot and say, the PD has been applied and now I'm going to have an outbuilding. Oh, Sorry, it ain't right. right. happening. Right. Right. Because the dimensions have been worked out. You know, <coughs> proportionments of open space and right. all the mm -hmm. traffic controls and all the other stuff is all worked out. And that map is that map. Right, right, right. But I'm just saying maybe, I don't know, maybe a different way of building it out. Yeah. It, it the same. In, in some towns, like this is this is the town of Mall, the Mall. they have like 87 PDDs. Every single one of them is in code, is in the code. Yeah. Every, and same thing works for with um Hidden Moon, Hidden Moon, Harvest Moon, what that's the name of Every single one of the Half Moon New York, every single one of their, their PDDs, which they have a lot of them too, are all outlined in code, in our code. Ours aren't in our code. As when you say uh, outline their code, what, they are designed it? as part of their code. Each is named individually in the code, so that if and it says, you know, this so like, like a, said, Malta a says, says um, our code. yeah, mm -hmm. right. and they, they'll say, well, this this certain development district is is going to be this. I don't have Malta. It's it just um, and it can function right in the zoning map is another. Yeah, I think we all agree yeah. on that code. I, I don't yeah. think. And so it's it's specifically, you know, defined in the code of, of what it is. So it's interesting. Ours aren't. See, this one is, um, yeah, that's just. Well, they're going to be because we can only have so many. Yeah. Well. Yeah. But this. Well, the, yeah. the problem the problem I have, and I'm, in the defense of I mean, the map. Well, this is a new um, Intel, yeah. like AMD microchip. Yeah. 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 Of the master plan the intent of the master plan <laughs> is to be able to tell things. people what would happen in your backyard right right here and something so the master plan says you got m1 in your backyard or it says it have you r1a or you got b you got b1 you got b2 so it's like the same issue with the farm if you know up front that you have a farm next to you right. then when you buy you know what you're getting into so the master plan is basically your protection for the community that I know it's in my backyard because I know I'm sitting in, a, in an area that is R1A and I know what R1A is and therefore I'm willing to invest my property and be there. If, I, if I'm sitting on Grand Island Boulevard and I'm sitting in the business district and I have a home, I can't complain about the business developing around me. So therefore you have the option, you can sell and move into an area that's more accommodating to what you would want in your backyard. So the PDD though, 
is the fly that drives me crazy because the PDD could be whatever the PDD is. Therefore, I can't count on what is in my backyard. And that's why I think a PDD almost applies to a town and into a hamlet area because you're already living with business and residential, right? Working in together in that area. So Sandy Beach is has a business district within its residential. If you're at River Rope, it, it River Oaks, the same thing is occurring. You've got Ransom Road, that's occurring. You've got Long Road, that's occurring. You've got Love Road, that's occurring. And then you've got the center of town. Yeah. So therefore, if you're living in there, so a PDD seems to be, okay, that I understand may be something that will occur and I may be able to live with. But if you start throwing them all over the town of Grand Island, right. that's when it becomes a problem. In the PDD, when it comes to residential PDD, the question is, why are you doing a residential PDD when we're looking at growth issues on Grand Island and you're taking a PDD and the intent of the PDD with residential is to pack as much housing into a parcel of land you possibly can. And that's where the rub comes, is that, wait a minute, the density behind me is a house per acre. And all of a sudden now you're saying, oh, they're gonna do six houses per acre. Okay, now that's a problem. And, and that's where the residents start to get upset. And I don't blame them because the issue is that was not the intent of my backyard. My intent was I'm going to have townhouses behind me. The intent was not that you're going to have me 400 townhouses, but it was going to be proportional to the townhouses that coexist around me, which are roughly five. So therefore, again, we're trying to build the master plan to basically go on and protect the residents for what is going to happen in their backyards. And to me, the PDD that's been we're looking at is basically saying we're not going to address the PDD as a residential development, but looking at the PDD to be a, a multi-use development with residential and commercial combined. And therefore, what has been happening with the Radisson, the design would fit. Yep. But it may not fit if you turn around and put 500 townhouses behind a grocery store. We're not asking for that. I have a question. Yes. Judy, you mentioned the Whitehaven PDD now has an ag designation. It's got it's got an agricultural um, property exemption on it. It's not part of the ag district. It's got an agricultural exemption on it of about a hundred and some thousand dollars. So they're not paying. So they're they so so there's certain regulations when you get an agricultural exemption. So that if you want to convert it back to a regular, you know non-agricultural um, farmland, you know, let regular tax paying thing, you've got penalties and taxes and stuff like that. And there's yeah, other, my, other question, my question is, is how did we go from PDD, which the blueprint is the code under PDD, and that particular property was all lots, residential lots, yeah. and then now they're turned it into a farm exemption, didn't they kind of like forfeit their PDD by doing that? Again, the rules basically say, the rules say, and the town could take action now and call a public hearing and then turn around and take the PDD away. But there's, again, where's the, where's the initiative to turn around and do that? Okay. Well, isn't it the initiative that they turn to the farm exemption? They did it to themselves. Yeah, they did. So Sheila, would that would that be okay under eggs and markets and and what what this so, is? No. So you get an ag assessment if you are commercially utilizing the land for agriculture. I, I don't understand how that property would have been provided an ag assessment. Don't you have to produce like ten thousand dollars worth of? No. Correct. There are limitations that you definitely have to. You have to make ten thousand dollars. I think that's where the sheep. The sheep guy keeps the sheep. Am I not? Am I? Uh, that's the right property where the sheep oh, were. Now oh, I don't know if they're still no. there. They're raising hay. buckwheat. Yeah, they're. Wait, wait, wait. So the property that you're talking about that has a PDD is currently agriculture property yes. mm -hmm. they are farming 
Yeah. That's, how they, that's how they get the ag assessment. They only need to reach the threshold of $10,000 in revenue. And that's how they reach it. Yeah. Well, my point Whether, is what, what I get your point though, Dave, right? Does that mean that they can also then have an open PDD? Right. But it's they have both. It sounds like you're double dipping. Yes, yeah. it is. But it's, the question is, what is the, where is the tipping point for the town to turn around and take action on that? Where is the, what is the process or the mechanism for them to take action? Well, I think it's the hundred and twenty some thousand dollar. What is it? An ex tax exemption, Judy, or they got money? It's a property tax exemption of one hundred twenty three thousand dollars. I, I think that's it. I think it's a a money issue that they got this money issue. Then that's that should be. The, the Wouldn't that be an board, incentive? The town board's incentive. Farmers, they have buckwheat crops on their site plan. That's. <laughs> they're leasing the land the owners are leasing the land to somebody to to farm it oh they have the ownership hasn't changed they're just leasing the land for an alternate use yeah but they're leasing the land that's that's zone pdd which you're right. not allowed to farm in a pdd because the blueprint is the code and the blueprint and i've seen it is all residential lots the whole thing there isn't a piece of green space in that thing. So what is what is the tipping point for action to be taken? I think I think because they're getting this tax exemption. I think they should forfeit they should have they can't get it two ways. They can't get a taxes exemption and a PDD exemption. You can't get it all. Well if you turn around and have the law so it automatically expires with lack of activity, meaning other right. than water, which, I agree, which I agree with. Nobody has to be the bad guy. That's why there has to be. Yeah. Just have to, otherwise, it can, that's where you can feed into saying right. chair. Well, uh, we've looked at every single development and we looked at all of PDDs. We looked at the history of PDDs. And if looking going forward, and we really want to discuss looking at more effectively, looking at how to make the comp plan come forward and, and looking at how do we accomplish the objectives of mixed use, I think this is a, a, a first good step in doing so. Um, so at this time, I'd like to entertain a motion that we approve and send this on to the town board uh, for consideration. I have a motion. <laughs> Go ahead, fire away. Well, I'll have we'll okay. make a motion, and then we'll turn around and have a discussion. I'll make a motion to to send it to the town board for for uh, as a recommendation to send it to the town board for their consideration. Okay. Good second. I'll second the discussion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good discussion. Um, my question is 407 121, which is the second page. Um, section A, the overly distance eliminate the section in current law. I just want a definition of what that means. Absolutely. Well, that's because we don't have any overlay districts, so we might as well get rid of them because they expire automatically. Yes. In the current code of the 25 acres, there's an overlay in it. Mm -hmm. and the overlay is it versus you have a PDD and you have an overlay PDD, right. meaning that I'm going to use the overlay. Well, no developer is ever going to use the overlay because it has an automatic automatic cancellation in, in the three and the five years. Mm -hmm. So everybody sticks with the PDD. So we've never approved an overlay. So the question is then eliminate it okay. out of that. All right. And then also because you've eliminated it, you also turn around and say this law, the 25 acres, will also eliminate. The odds will eliminate having to go to a public hearing and will be automatically reverting back to its current zoning if not accomplished in this two to five years. Gotcha. Understood. Thank you. Okay. One second. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify um, Dave's comment about the three years under the automatic yeah. termination. Yes. That we didn't decide to change that to two. We're leaving that at three. I think three is what I've seen in other towns. That's the only reason I'm sticking with the three. Dave, you feel three or should be two? No, you made the, the argument that you have to give them a little time to get up to speed. I, I understand that. So like, like the Whitehaven piece, David Holmes should be able to have a little extra time to do something there. Where instead of being stuck for right. two years, they have construction within three years. It says if any of the following actions are not taken. So it's either if you don't have a permit or you haven't started any construction. So kind of like 
Do you really need the first one? But it says that, <laughs> well, no, it, it reads quite, I, I'm reading that a little different, that you either have to have your building permit or construction. But it says in the event any of the following actions are taken. That's why legal has to take a look at it to make sure right. that we're, we're, you right. know, we, we've got all. commas and ands and ors in the right place. That, that, that's, that's why I just kind of said, you know what, legal will figure out exactly how this works. Yeah, my feeling is that we're giving them a skeleton we'd like yeah. them to function with. And I'm certain the planning board is going to put its, its branding on it. And then Tom Blue's going to put his branding on it. And the attorney's going to put the branding on it. But at least we're putting forward the intent of what we're trying to accomplish with this with this draft. I just think we need to be a little bit clearer on the PDD site shall not be less than 10 acres. That's all it says. I don't believe that there, that public roads should be permitted to, to, to divide the acreage. I mean, 10 acres isn't a lot. Uh, yeah, let's put those pieces in you were talking about. Let's talk about those. Because it's really seven acres when you have 25% of it. Well, yeah, so yeah, the stuff I was talking about. Yeah. Well, actually, what I had sent to Jim, I said a minor PDD shall not be less than 10 acres for commercial residential development of mixed use buildings only. And then, and I said the proposed development shall be in uh, conform to the town's master plan. And then I had a definition of, of mixed use residential buildings that says, there's probably state code or something that says buildings, uh, residential units are subordinate to the uses of the primary ground floor commercial use subject to the following provisions. And you can't build them over a service station or any place else that stores flammable material. The habitable area has to be at least 500 feet and each one has to have uh, separate and complete living areas and, um, you know, sleeping year round, use for one family. And uh, they can't be located on the first floor, and each apartment shall contain all the services for safe and convenient, convenient habitation, meaning New York State codes. And they all, the units shall have access to the outside of the building, which must be distinct from the access uses for the first floor. And each residential unit shall meet all applicable town all street parking requirements. So that was just something that I got from somebody else. I, uh, the, the only question I had when I finished doing all this was, is the town going to allow mixed use building in major PDDs? And what's the open space percentage of a minor PDD? In other words, are we going to say, you need to have 25%, which is two and a half acres of 10 acres. Are we gonna say, because we're looking at mixed use, we really want it to be more, how do we do it if somebody's building a plaza, Dave? How much open space do they need if they're like, where Mazer builds on the boulevard, how much open space does he need in, in that area? So kind of like looking at, it's more of like a commercial development than it is a residential development. And we did say 25% uh, in this. Right? Yeah, okay. and that's the only thing, well, that's the one thing that I think that they will iron out to take a look at it. We're just saying we think that this is the way to solve the mixed use problem. Yeah, I, I thought we said last meeting we were sticking with the 25% on the 10 right. acres. So, okay. You just put less. I think a There's lot of that too, Judy, is already to, like, would be in our design standards. Yeah. It's a matter of what we're allowing upstairs and downstairs and mixed use. Because the rest of that, a lot of that would already fall into our design standards. Uh -huh. So you'd have to define, like, you know, you can't have an industrial use underneath of or, 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 yeah. or a residential, but I see where, like, I understand. I, I just about. wanted to yeah. define, I didn't want people to go crazy and say, well, we can do this and we can do that. Yeah. We've got, we've got, We've had mixed use on the island in a lot of different places. We yeah. just haven't, we just kind of looked the other way. Or... Yeah, we just kind of looked the other way. I mean, I have a lot of apartments on the, on the boulevard that were over stores, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> no, no. My other question would be is when the mixed use code does come into effect, would the 10 acre PDD, would that supersede the 10 acre PDD? That's a good question. Um, from all indication I have right now, getting a mixed use zoning mm -hmm. is becoming um a bit, a bit uh, difficult to attain so the mixed sure. use i mean i think an issue should be developed but the issue of it being uh developed with so many options that they can't seem to feel how they can um pigeonhole it okay 
Yeah, the, the ones yeah. I saw, Dave, yeah. were more mixed-use districts, so that they specifically picked out places in the in the municipalities for mixed use, and then defined that particular district as as mixed as allowing mixed use. Where we're saying a parcel could be, we could apply for yeah. a minor PDD there if we're mixed use. But the okay. only way you could get mixed use right now. Well, you can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. unless you have twenty-five acres. So, and, and, I, and that's why I said that this is the this is a um, a good first step. But I believe that what Judy just raised the question of in the town center, we can definitely make it a mixed use district. Therefore, it can be permitted within the district. So, therefore, you are confining where the mixed uses would be based on the master plan. Then, because the, obviously, this is moving us. Through the next level of where we go when we start amending the comprehensive plan and how do we then start applying our, our uses and therefore we may be making recommendations in the future that there be mixed use districts applied within the comp plan for us managing our hamlets and that's one of the things that i felt was going to come out of the hamlet designs is how then do you deal with hamlets and deal with mixed use within the hamlet and what is the tool for it to occur and right now, I think the, the PDD is the instrument, I think, currently, but I think that that instrument may change when we actually commence a, a Hamlet study. Well, okay. it's also that it's difficult right now for somebody to think in those parameters without the density. Because I think that that needs to be done, because one of the things that River Oaks is concerned by everybody down there is that right now it's cookie cutter, and they're uncomfortable because there's a cookie cutter thing going on. You have a parcel and you can, you, uh, how do you fit with the other parcel? And we, in, in the master plan, looking at saying, no, you all need to play nicely in sandbox, mm -hmm. but they're not because they don't have a map that we're basically giving them how, what can pieces do we need within the hammock for density issues, resident commercial issues, and on and on. So to me, those issues got to be addressed in, in, in addressing the hamlets uh, through a professional study is the only way we're going to answer that question. And, and I see that a lot when my, my son was down in Knoxville, Tennessee, and, and the growth, the uncontrolled growth on there is unbelievable. And where, and how, what, you know, five, five years ago when he moved on the road, it was mostly farmland and rolling hills. And now we, I drive down there and there, there's just condos and apartments and everything. All, I can't believe how much it has grown in a, you know, 10, 15 miles from downtown Knoxville. Out in right. I could go if you didn't let me up to Houston in the middle of our center and our business districts. I mean, if you really think about it, it's pretty much conformed that they're pretty much, besides maybe for the plaza, 25% green space around where most of. So there's some conformity that if you put an excuse into those business districts, it would fit into what's currently there. Right. There. So you're, I mean, you're, not a, you're not so dense. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But what it comes yeah. down to is when we talked about out. the town center of Town of Grand Island and what does it take to be a center? What yeah. does it take to be a village? And we talk about critical mass, right? Mm -hmm. What is it? How many people does it take to actually create <clears throat> a town center? Mm -hmm. Well, Hamlet's the same thing, but it's on a smaller scale. Right. So no, then the okay. question comes back is, what is the density required in a hamlet? Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's going to say how much commercial space, how many residential yeah. space, and then how are you going to use your property to maintain I that, think that care? Totally the hamlet aspect, but I think the business district, I mean, I think what we're doing with the 25% the way it is, that's the way it, it would conform with how we've been building up out of Grand Island. And when we look at these hamlets and these small areas, yeah, we could address that exactly. Look at that and say, do we want to change that density outer? When we want to do a mixed use there, you know, our green space allows if I'm understanding all this. Yeah, but if we're trying to build a town center, allowing mixed use in the town center, okay. that's you know, that's what that's what everybody talks about. Oh, like, 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 we want to be like Lutz, and we want to be like you know, the Easter War. Well, they're they're <laughs> the density of those two those two villages is 2,900 people per, per square mile, which is, coincidentally is exactly what Grand Isle Village is. If you just take that little area down there, mm -hmm. which is Grand Isle Village, we call right. it Grand MLID. But it's um so that's the kind of density you're looking at for those two particular villages. We keep trying to compare ourselves to how we want to be, yeah. which 
We are just to our customers. No, no, I, no, I think people. I think people want the services available. You know, I think that nobody's obtuse enough to to say for five miles of road you're going to have the field, the field of mill, the uh, field of Lewiston or East Aurora. No, even yeah. East Aurora had to remanufacture. The state had yeah. to give them all that money for Main Street. They had to remanufacture around Midlers and a few other historic well, blocks. Right. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I just think here people want the services and if you don't have some mixed use you won't have any right. developers who decide right. they want to build up a little on their space it's just not worth it with 20 well, right. 30,000 right. right. yeah. years yeah. on the road 20 oh, yeah. 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 yeah you get a couple of fast food places and I'm right. gonna pack a yeah. just what I need. Gonna start one. Yeah. Yeah. Just what I, need. I, want a Panera. I have another question <laughs> from glory over here <laughs> <laughs> I have 10 acres and I'm not in the, you know, North South Center business district, or I'm not in a hamlet and I'm in a residential district. Can I get this 10 acre PDD with the mixed use? I think that's what you're going to have to look at because again, it's a <laughs> change. It's a zoning change, right? Yeah. And you're going to look at what is acceptable within that area and what will be condoned within the area. Because anytime you do a zoning change, it isn't right as a right. It's actually a privilege for the town to give it to them. Right. Right. It's an option. So therefore, if you got a, if you got something just developing itself into a mixed use in an area which has always been residential, I think it's going to come down to it's going to be thrown back to the master plan saying, does it fit in your comp plan? And the answer would be uh, currently not. Okay. And, right. Okay. So. Again, you're looking at the law that's being presented by saying that it's in the first pair, it's in the, the, the rec first recommendation that says Perfect. it shall be in the best and the general welfare of the public and meets the objective of the town's conference of plan. Okay. I think also, Dave, you have to look at, I mean, putting, taking 10 acres that isn't on where people would normally go because you have to remember the bottom of it's going to be commercial. So it has to be some place that would attract the customers, the patients, the clients, whatever, to that commercial establishment. So putting it, you know, uh, uh, down on fixed road somewhere, perhaps that wouldn't be a, a really good business plan. So, I mean, putting it on Love Road, where we already have the density, or putting it on, you know, where our hamlets are that would make more sense. So I don't know the business plan would really make sense to try to put it in some out of the way 10 acre place. But if somebody wanted to try to do it, they certainly will figure it out. Well, they gotta have bigger cases. <laughs> yeah, they're they gonna to have to show case. how it fits within the comp plan. Right. Uh, and the comp plan, basically, we're gonna defend what we've done as far as land usage. Again, the comp plan is telling people what your backyard is intended to be. And if somebody says we're going to put the PDD there, you know it's going to raise a whole lot of or raise a lot of eyebrows. But the question does it fit within the comp plan? Currently, we have charrettes. We we designated what the hamlets are, uh, so therefore uh, that may be a functional area for them to occur. But I, you know, my feeling is that's where they're probably land. I, I think maybe one of the other things that we could like when we're looking at multi-use and mixed use is is whether are we talking about a single family home or we want to we want it at least a two family dwelling above this commercial space in other words you can't build a store and then build an apartment for you to live in above it is that not what we're looking at as far as mixed use is concerned exactly this is minimum 10 acres. Well, well isn't isn't that the beauty of what we're doing i mean isn't that the whole purpose of the pde i mean doesn't somebody have to come in and, and present what they want to do and then yeah. And then we make a good look at it and see if it fits. I mean, this this is the yep. this is the, we can always, it can always be rejected. Everybody has an opportunity to present oh. it. Yep. Right. Well, there's a public hearing. Yeah. And there can't be fear of right. I hear some of the chatter in the at least through zoning. Well, we did it for one person. We have to do it for other. I don't believe in that at all. Mm -hmm. It's not an equity fairness agreement. It's that yeah. we do what we want with our land. That's why we make these rules up. Not, but I think you can't be afraid of someone suing you. Mm -hmm. in any of this stuff we we're making decisions long term for yeah but you can't use that as a way to make your decision either you can't say well we're just not going to make a decision and 
we'll just let the courts make the decision for us. So no, I, I think you have to make a decision if someone yeah, wants to see. Yeah. Well, you did it on the other side of the island with this teenager lot. Okay, we're talking about your that project. Side of the island is different side of right. the island. Right, it's a different Maybe project. It has different everything. Right? Mm -hmm. You have to yeah. somebody right now in that eastern end of Whitehaven who's going to say you did it across the street. Why not my property? You guys didn't do a comp plan no, because the same all over the island. island. Right. right. Yeah, my plan is different. This different. All right. So I'm going to call. I'm going to call the question. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, we'll just send it to them all the time. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody against? Now I would also go on record that uh, Draxilius has turned around, reviewed it, and we have made any modifications. There, he's, he voices his opinion. Yes. And then Paul Lecter has also done the same, and both of them sent emails off to Rhonda indicating they have reviewed the document and they're in agreement. Uh, Jim, Jim, can I just abstain from that vote? Yes, you can because it's going to go to you. Right, yeah, because it's going to come back to the planning board. I'd like to hear what 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 the members on the planning board have to say. Yes. Is that okay? Can I do that? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Raise your hand, Jim. That was a. That was a yes, not a no, correct? <coughs> Jim, Jim. Hold me here. Jim, was that, were you voting yes, Jim? He's muted. Jim. Jim, what? Unmute. Oh, yes. It's a yay, not a nay. Push the space bar. Dog must be barking. It's not unmuting. Yay, yay. Yay. I will check a little bit. Okay. Thank you. So, we're, what we're going to do is Judy has raised some issues that I think that are pertinent to what we're talking. So we're going to actually incorporate those into the minutes. Uh, Dave, when you get this from you, please review, have the members review the tape for our discussion here tonight. It could be informational for them. But also we're going to review, we're going to include some of the comments that have been raised in the minutes of this meeting that so the town planning board should look at the minutes of the meeting as well as look at the document we've submitted. Okay. Jim, would, right. you, would you have enough time, Jim, to have your meetings sent to Arlene so it would end up on our agenda for next planning board meeting? Sure. Would we have enough time to do that? Yeah. Okay, thanks. And your next meeting is, you're talking in September, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have to have a hard stop at 8.30. Uh, which I know is going to probably take me to 8, to 8.45. But the, uh, I want to talk about the LWRP. Um, we have made our conversation with the, with the State Department. Um, there's been a number of uh, lengthy meetings with uh, the planner, myself, and the State Department discussing uh, the recommendations she's, she, was, she was making. Uh, that you would like to see done in the comp plan that we submitted to the State Department. She's added a great deal of content to it. Um, one, one of them, uh, one of her recommendations that she had made was that we, did, we uh, in doing the master plan or the LWRP, uh, we turned around and included the stream corridors up to the headwaters, right? Before the, the stream corridors were not part of the LWRP. Uh, with our new LWRP, we actually put the stream corridors in. So, uh, Gun Creek, Spicer Creek, uh, all the creeks basically uh, are in the, the LWRP now. She had made the recommendation that we don't use the boundaries of the creek, meaning the 100 foot markers, but we actually turn around and use streets, which means that it would incorporate a whole lot of residential lots into the LWRP. The problem with that would have been is that anybody that does anything there with their property would have to go and get a clearance of the LWRP approval. Mm. Okay, so we decided in uh, in discussion, no, we're not doing that. That we are going to maintain the hundred foot marker of the stream corridors and the properties that are affected by it being in their backyards. They would have, if they're going to do anything on the creeks, they would have to ask permission or ask for a, a ruling from us on the OWRP as to what they intend to do. 
So in most cases, nobody's messing with creeks. You would have to go to the core, you'd have to go to DEC, you got all that stuff going on. And so therefore there's nobody building bridges, there's nobody changing the channels, there's nobody doing anything in those areas. So therefore we're minimizing the impact on the residential side. And so we pushed back on the State Department on this issue and said, no, we're not doing that. And so therefore we've taken out uh, that major hurdle. Um, in, in when you start to get the document we're finally gonna get, you're gonna see where she's indicated that it minimized and minimized and minimized. Yes, we did. Okay, because we don't want to have our residents panicking because all of a sudden they're part of a, a stream corridor that they will have permission to do something, uh, and they will have to have permission anyways because they're in it. They're trying to mess with the stream, so that's coming up. But also, the State Department has also indicated that they're prepared to allow the document to go for, further uh, in the town structure and actually call for the town to start creating the secret process and start the 60-day review. So we're trying to get the document approved. Uh, I talked to the planners uh, and the issue was they have not final and they wanna make sure they finalize the language that we wanna have in the document. So we're not getting it into a situation of the, of the state turn around and saying, uh, we didn't say that, we said something else. So we're doing right now with Justin is make sure we got our stuff in writing uh, and our document has been finalized with us before we actually start the 60 day review. And that's where we stand right now. So you're gonna be seeing us moving forward in the next few months to start putting that document in front of you all. And then we're gonna talk about what has been modified by the State Department, uh, which I feel a lot of it's positive. Um, and they did a great job. Their, the biggest issue was in a number of areas was where is the boundary in the river for the river boundary? And there was a great deal of work done as far as what is it? And where is it? And the State Department was really emphatic about, I don't see it anywhere in the, the establishment of the town of Grand Island of where your boundary is in the river. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think we're getting very, very close to having our other key to the point where we're going to move it on to the town board to start the secret process, which they will be the league agency, and then to start the 60 day review, which means all agencies in the state of New York in the county and so on, will then have their ability to uh, take on the document and make comments. And that'd be the core, that'd be DEC and that number. Um, so that in itself is what we are. Um, in closing, is there anything at the table, the round table, that you would like to bring to our attention at this time? I want to ask a question of the chamber. Any discussions on what they think of the uh, Radisson property? That you would be willing to share? Uh, yeah, there. I would say that on, on the topic, the, the major part of the discussion was I think everybody's for a transformation of the project um, and not not waiting and hoping on the proper hotel owner over, over years. Um, there was a lot of good debate on that, but I think the biggest discussion was the difference between condominiums and apartments, the size of which the overall feel of that, but I think that's more of a do I like orange or cherry better? Not that I like blue, yeah. you know. Um, I talked to some of the directors who were sitting there before, and I had a certain impression that I got them from them, and I respect their opinion. I was surprised when I went to the, the meeting with the neighbors, and you know, I live right there, so yeah. I'd be more interested to see what they had to say. And in lack of the best terms, our town would be a no, 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 pushing back on things. I thought the residents were very favorable at the meeting. There was a I thought a positive feedback that they were they were happy to see that. So I was just wondering. I think you generally we have an opinion. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm not saying that it was like you guys are against or anything. I was just interested if it was discussed and and yeah, still, I think uh, it's a positive project. Still kind of bounced around. I think one of the areas we we've all talked about was to have a, a more thorough presentation. Everybody on the chamber board is all connected to the island and has I herds. Yeah, yeah I'm right, not right. I heard guy. Like I like right. we got information that not. Yeah, I think we're a little bit off on that, but we'd love to see, just like the neighbors, I yeah. think full utilization of potential of that property is not even close to being met. So <laughs> if we can there. I agree, I, yeah. yeah. It just seems like that there's, there seems to be like a lot of players in the mix mm -hmm. in order to get, <laughs> and, and it seems like everything's kind of being, I mean, I've listened to all your planning board stuff and all the questions. It's a little hard to hear sometimes, but um, well, the question is about two acres, which I think is going to be fixed out. 
And then, but I, I personally wish the town would keep that strip of land there. I wish we could do something with it or use that as an well, you know, I, I Is I that really off the table? Because from a conversation I had recently, I don't know if it is off the table or not. not. So, so, you know, I'm not really sure about that. But I'm just thinking it just seems to be like, it seems to be like there's a lot of, a lot of, Loose ends and well, things that have to be parts that have yeah, and yeah, in order yeah. for the and whole it, thing. It's I'm just gonna, like, I'm holy sure man, from my head is spinning. Listen, yeah. to, but I they gotta have this land, we gotta have this, so I'm gonna keep this, and this is gonna go over here, and then this. I'm like, holy mackerel, yeah. are you guys really gonna get this all done in the next two months? Yeah, no, I mean, it's traffic was my concern, but like one of the discussions I had with somebody was like, well, we could have an oxy chem sitting there for another 30 years there. Just the police is falling apart. I mean, like, you really don't see anyone. So it's falling apart day by day. Like, I'd rather see it utilized and get better. Yeah, they order. have trouble time even mowing the lawns there. So yeah. Yeah. trouble. <laughs> and, and I think the town keeping that piece of property just becomes a big liability with, with all the people that they're intent on putting in there. They've got access. They can build their own access. Yeah, I, I would like to see that little strip. I mean, I've looked at some of their projects that they've done. I went to the architect and the whatever, and they've done some beautiful. Yeah, yeah the, the, the Utah yes. developers. Yeah, yeah they, they, they got instead of all they've got there. some other stuff here in <laughs> Western New York they're doing right now too. I apologize, I'm late. Can we wait for right? Okay. All right. Thanks for town council is going to come up before the board. So I don't know if you wonder the technology board was looking at the sign issue. Um, we have voted the fact that, that the sign should fall under your preview and that be part of your development and we support whatever you're going to be putting forward as long as there's a technology sign involved in. And so yes, it's out of our out of off our table, right, Jim? <coughs> yeah, but can't we get some of your money? <laughs> well, you have to do is ask. <laughs> yeah. I'm asking, Jim. <laughs> can we have some money out of the the uh, the uh, technology trust fund there? Yeah, why not? Yeah, so, why not? Just for the sign. Yes, I mean, why not? Well, yeah. let's 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 put together a plan for the sign. I think that's yeah. we've been dancing around that. What the sign's going to look like. Month. How much is going to cost? Uh, last night with the uh, the with Bartman with Judas Nicole from Bartman with Judas. So Tom's going to bring it up to the next board meeting to get the final contract approval to move forward with the design with the um, the original <coughs> the initial concept design and then the sixty percent design going forward from that. So it takes about three to six months. So we would be ready for uh, the twenty twenty three um, grant season. Yeah. So we're hoping that maybe by 2024 that um, <laughs> that perhaps we can get something done, or maybe before that, because I, I'd like to look at a couple other sources for the creek, because that might fall onto your maybe Greenway or something like that, as opposed to the ADA paths we want in other places. So we're 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 hoping we can get a really nice nice looking town center there and. And, and get something done there. Okay. So. We just want to make sure from the technology right board, instead of mm -hmm. having two players trying to play in the same uh, space, sure. then we felt that it really should belong under yours and we support you on the objective that you have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, when I when I I did a, a PowerPoint presentation on, on on presenting it anyway when I was trying to get people to do it and uh, the sign was included. Okay. So um that works for us, right, Jim? Yeah. That works. <clears throat> so okay. Yeah. If we can be of any help, we'd be happy to help. Uh, yeah, and we're also looking at um, what we discussed last night about um, tearing down the demoing the, the mash and building three at the Nike base. So, is building three the one where they've been storing the uh, equipment, the stone bill equipment? No, no, that one's still okay. That's okay. No, that's the, the building three is the one that's right near the trailhead. That, okay. That, yeah. So the yep. rough is gone. Hey, uh, hey Judy. Not the, one that's, not the one right at the end. The one that's like, if you're looking down the driveway, it's over here. And the, and the, and the other one is by which the one, hill. Which one's by, by the hill. hill? Yeah. I was going to say the hill. The dog park. Is it by the hill? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's building three. And the MASH building is the other building that's, they have a tractor in it at one point. I would I, 
Hey, Judy, are they building a new hockey rink in the Kegabine? Yes, there will be two of them there. They're going to have two of them because I think what it is is they want, hopefully, that I think they want one that the kids can play hockey on and some, another one that would one. be recreational skating because they're sometimes- There's a gentleman on the island that clears that off. Yeah, and takes care of that. So it's, you know, it's a conflict. Oh, the boys all think the kids want to play oh, hockey and the other kids just want to- right. Right. The little ones just want to skate around and, you know. Huh? So, yeah, that's what they're doing. Facebook of them clearing it out. Okay. Right. I was doing that. Or doing that portion. Yeah, we have a little skating ring at the Nike base. Well, there's a little bus depot thingy there. Yeah. there. It looks like a little bus depot, but there's a guy that's been doing it for years. He goes over there by himself with a little one that's picking the bike. And he's been taking care of that for years. And I don't think anybody knows that it's him doing it. Yeah. Now they're doubling like it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thing. And then one would be recreational programs. Yeah. And we also have still have our, our dormitory authority grant from the, uh, from Sorrento for, for the, the Nike base. $125,000 to spend on the Nike base. But we have to see right now the scope of that grant it does not include building the pavilion that they would like to spend the money on. So they have to see if they can get the scope. You know, change. keep in mind if you guys do talk about knocking that building down, that whatever you pull off that site will still have to be tested. Same thing happened with us on the other. They will they have to test it because wherever they're gonna go dump it and take it to, they have to know exactly what's in that truck. If, and if that's for the DUC when we worked with the title on it coke. We went through a whole thing on that, and there were off properties that were tested, and there was nothing on that. But no matter what you take off of that, it's it's still going to have to be tested on a certain level as to where that's going to go to get to be removed. Well, one of those things, it, the, the buildings are being than, the buildings are being yeah. condemned. So the buildings are being condemned. Yeah. Then they can be demo demoed as construction demo, mm -hmm. and and you do a wet demo on it, and you really you don't need to monitor the air really because you're going to wet you're right. going to wet it's it down. It's a matter of taking it off the property, and it's going to be it'll be dumped it'll be dumped and tipped as as construction debris. But not, it still has to be tested, even no matter where it goes. No. In, in the DVC in New York State, if you take anything outside out of out of a truck into some kind of waste yard or whatever it is, no matter what it is, it has to be tested. We did this at a playground we were doing this for, no matter what, and he gave us like a whole 45 minute lecture. I'm like, this is, I mean, whatever, it is what it is, but keep that in mind. Well, like, I'll I, look it up more. Or okay. Well, actually, more. I called my brother who's a demolition contractor. Yeah, it's still be tested. Yeah, it's still going to be tested. Night. Good night, everybody. Uh, round, round table real quick. Yeah, from, go from the planning board. We're getting Starbucks in the Tops Plaza in an outbuilding next to Key Bank. Yeah. And we're going to get a Taco Bell in the old uh, Christmas tree farm lot. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, I voted against the Radisson because I felt there was too many questions and not enough straight answers. Right. Yeah, I agree and with you. And I've read a lot of print print out there a newspaper that a lot of the information in the newspaper the sentinel is one is incorrect yeah you know on apartment sizes and rents yeah. that's not what they they pitched the planning board last the last meeting i got a question for you real quick because i really have to be out in the parking lot to accept uh dad for um did the planning board adopt it as a PDD 10 acres? Or did it adopt it as a special incentive zoning approval? Um, PDD 10 acres, not the extra land that they're giving as the commission that they spoke about, the two acres or whatever on the north, what the south or north side. And we had uh, we added to the incentive zoning section, just not that 320 feet of frontage in front of the four homes, but all the way down to the existing holiday in parking lot and 10 spaces into the parking lot. Okay, so my question is, is the incentive allowing you to reduce the 25 acres to 10 acres or Yes. Are you anticipating yes. the 10 acres to be approved 
to have the project. The, that was the incentive zoning, which this has to be approved by the town board. But yes, that was a component to reduce it to the 10 acres, not the 12 point something, which included that land that they're giving away as what they call the commission for someone putting this project together, that they wouldn't tell us who it was. Got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. I love the pieces. Yeah. Where, your finances? Where did the boat launch rumor come from, or idea come from? You can't have a boat launch there. Yeah, but I was just wondering where it came from because people keep mentioning it. I, just I, it I think it's just one of those things that people say, oh, we could put a boat launch there. We tried to buy that property many years ago. We got a grant to buy it. Yeah. Well, we could never well, come it to be like there on a turn and the whatever. Oh, yeah, you can't. So I was like, where did that come from? That Jen, Jen, yeah. uh, Jen, we were told that that was uh, that we don't have town owned public access to the river, right? Well, we I could see state like, owned, we have state right. owned, but not yeah. town owned, like a kayak or something. But like the whole idea of having a motorized boat launch there would be. I mean, it's dangerous enough as it is there, I can imagine. But it would have had to have been developed and that would have had to have been, there would have had to have been extra. So, yeah, yeah, I just yeah. can't imagine. Extra road going connecting to that part. I won't even drive down there. Yeah, I don't. Well, I'm scared. All right, All right. Now, let's hand a motion to adjourn. Okay. okay, so. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.